We've all been very confused when we can't have our way. Is that not why you fight with your spouse? Is not, not why you have arguments with your children? Is that not why you get frustrated and want to vote differently? Is that not why you might have struggles with people in your small group or even church leadership? Our obsession with wanting control reflects a desire to be God rather than see God. You know, we want to know Him. And in order to know Him, you have to see Him. But you can't see Him if you're trying to be Him. I mean, those are lyrics to a pretty cool future song, I think. If some of you musicians want to make that one rock, you got to take a step back. You got to stop trying to be in control and recognize the authority and the power of God. Every book in the Old Testament, from book to book, from testament to testament, from writer to writer, from prophet to prophet, from apostle to apostle, they all recognize the sovereign power of God. And if anything has become clear to us as we've read through the Bible, it's this. If something needs to happen to accomplish God's agenda, he has the absolute capability to see that it does. Now, the operative term there is to accomplish God's agenda. He has an agenda. And as the prophet said, his agenda is not our agenda. His ways are not our ways. His agenda is higher than our agenda. His ways are higher than our agenda. Really, when we embrace this idea of power and sovereignty, it is all about matching agendas. There's a box in your notes. It's a, a quadrants image. And I like to compare a couple of things, a couple of um, values or, in this case, attributes of God that we're seeking compatibility between. And one is his affection, that is his love, and the other is ability. That is his power. Is he all loving and is he all powerful? And if we claim that he is both, how do we reconcile what's going on in the world today? Critics of ours will say, and you probably have had these conversations, they say you can't have it both ways. Either God is all loving or God is all powerful. But in light of what's going on around the planet, you can't say he's both. So let's combine a high love attribute. He's all loving. And a low ability attribute. He's not all powerful. What adds up when you put those together? You've got a feeble God. You've got one whom sinners would have no need to submit to. He demands nothing of us because he can't back it up. He doesn't have the ability. He loves us, but there's nothing he can do for us. And those of us, not that I'm one of them, but those of us Christians who claim this view of open theism do so because we're just trying to defend God. Theodicy is a term talks about the defense of God's goodness. We have to somehow in a conversation defend God's goodness to people who are judging him. You know, this is why Bible, the Bible is such an important document. If you only look to the world around us or you only watch the evening news, you wouldn't believe that he's sovereign. You wouldn't believe that a loving God could possibly have that kind of power, which is why it is really, really helpful to read his autobiography before you turn on the television set. And it's important to recognize what omnipotence means and what it doesn't mean. Omnipotence does not mean that God has the ability to do anything. Omnipotence means that God has unlimited power. That is, he can do anything, watch this, anything that he wants to do. See, as a question of why God allows evil, a powerful God allows evil to exist, as that question gains momentum in the last century or so, so has this psyche of entitlement. Have you noticed that in our culture? The belief that we are owed something. In this case, that God owes us something. In reality, God owes us nothing. He can never be placed on the defensive, neither is he ever under any obligation to provide anything whatsoever. In fact, um, when you consider that idea, I think philosopher Robert Adams put it best, 
when he asked this question, are you better off than if you had never existed? How would you answer that? Because if, if you would say, yes, I'm better off uh, than if I had never existed, then, then God has not wronged you. <laughs> Don't worry about anything. You know what the most, for a Christian who understands God's sovereignty, even a little bit, you know what the most meaningless statistic in all of sports is? The halftime score. God knows the end of the game. And even though God owes you nothing, and you're entitled to nothing, and you didn't deserve even any of the breaths that you have taken to this point today, there is still a sovereign God. If we were to make choices in cooperating with the glorious future that God has for us, even though we are not familiar with what that looks like yet, the Bible says we'd actually shorten the duration of our wanderings. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, I'll prove it to you. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. God's plan for history, you guys, agenda-driven. That's why our challenge is not to understand evil. Our challenge is to practice righteousness. Not to go back to Eden, but to move into the promise of our eternal reward. The question, has God treated you fairly? It's a good question. Let me give you the answer. Well, you'll know a lot more about the answer a half a second after you croak. But this is the thing. When it comes to why does God treat me the way he treats me? Why does God allow me to experience or have to go through the difficulties that he, that he has me go through? We only know this. If God chooses to not yet remove the difficulty, not yet terminate the evil, not yet save us from the calamity, we know that he'll be right there in the middle of the mess with us. We know he'll be taking every step with us. We know that because he is sovereign, he will absolutely protect us from any eternal harm, and he will absolutely protect our reward from any demonic looters. You know what that is? That's power. Now, I just want to close today by giving you a couple of thoughts, what I call the greatest irony in Jewish history. You ready? This will only take a minute. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. So all the elders of Israel, listen to what it says, all the elders of Israel come together. And they came to Samuel, the prophet Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, you are old, your sons do not follow your ways, so we're a little worried about the succession plan we got here. We want you to appoint a king for us, just like all the other nations have. Up to that point, Israel didn't have an earthly, bodily king. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, because he knew they already had one. They just couldn't see him. And so he goes to the Lord and he has this conversation. And the Lord tells him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. So then Sam goes back to the fellows and he says, you guys, come on. I just talked to the Lord. This is, this is jacked up somehow. Verse 19, people refuse to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then, <laughs> then we'll be like all the other nations. Yeah, you don't want to be like all the others. Anyway, we want to be like all the other nations, a king to lead us, to go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all that the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. He goes back to the Lord and he says, they ain't buying it. The Lord said, well, listen to them and give them a king. Give them what they want. Jesus said, what's impossible with man is possible with God. And Jeremiah said, ah, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And Father, I pray for my friends here in the beautiful city of Lakeside. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, because uh, you love them as you love the good people in Victorville, the high desert, the San Diego area, Dodger fan, Padre fan. You love us all with an eternal love. And you're going to lead us through. 
And may we recognize that. May we know that and respond in a manner that is appropriate in light of that reality. With everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, I don't know what you're going through, but would you just take a moment and reflect on the power of a sovereign God? Maybe you would have to admit that you were all about his power, not too sure about his sovereignty, but since you recognize as a package deal today, you would be willing to say, I admit that I fall short of submitting to your authority. That's called being a sinner. And I believe that Jesus was sent by God, our sovereign, all-powerful, all-loving Father, to save me from my stupidity, my short-sightedness, and my failures. And I choose today to place myself in the protective care of your love by choosing to follow Jesus as my Savior. Yeah, I give my life to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.